and then I'll get delta s squared over delta t squared equals c squared minus and then I have uh, delta x squared over delta t squared delta y squared over delta t squared and delta z squared over delta t squared and that I'm going to call u squared right in other words it's the ordinary Euclidean square of the Euclidean magnitude uh, length of the vector delta x over delta t, delta y over delta t, delta z over delta It's the Euclidean measure of the velocity. Uh, and if you look at that and this, then you can see that delta t over delta tor is 1 over 1 minus u squared over c squared. In other words, it's gamma of u. <coughs> so u squared, I'll write it down. I said it just then, but it's delta x squared over delta t squared plus delta y squared. Okay, so now we consider a vector. So we've got a, we've got a four-dimensional vector giving us a displacement, a, a, a vector joining one event to another event. It's a displacement vector. We're going to now work out a velocity vector, a four-dimensional velocity vector. This, is a th th this u here is the square of the length of a three-dimensional velocity vector. And of course, we know now that that's something that keeps changing whenever you change the observer. So we're going to construct a, a proper four-dimensional vector. And we, we do it like this. It's 1 over delta tor c delta t uh, delta x delta y delta z. In other words, if you take the displacement vector and divide it by delta tor, and do a little bit of work, not much, delta t over delta tor. So I, I divide everything by delta t inside here, and I get c, and then I get the three vector u. Um, just a minute, I haven't written that very clearly. delta t over delta tor. So all I've done is I've divided this by delta t and this and this and this. And I, in these positions I get the three components, delta x over delta t and so on, and that's just the vector, three vector u. Um, and we know what this is, we've just calculated it here. It's gamma of u, so C U. Uh, do I need to write down what U is? It's obvious, isn't it? That's okay. And this object is often referred to as the four velocity. It contains the same information as the um, as this u here, but it's expressed as a four-dimensional space-time vector, which is going to be much more useful. Um, <coughs> in fact, I've done all of this with finite differences, but I could have done all of this infinitesimally. I could have considered the case where the particle is not moving with constant velocity, but is accelerating, and then all of these deltas would simply change into a d for the derivative and in particular for example this expression here would simply become uh, dt d tor equals gamma of u but the expression for the four velocity is the same okay it's just the so e even an accelerating particle has a has a four velocity at any moment during its world line.
OK, so we knew, m move on. So that's enough about proper time. I, I'm not going to say any more. There is more that can be said, more games that can be played. But you, if you're looking at other books on, on special relativity, you will see also not just for velocity, but for acceleration, for force. In other words, there are four-dimensional versions of the three-dimensional objects, vectors, three-dimensional vectors that we use in physics. So um, position, velocity, acceleration, force. These are all vectors, right? And we need to be writing them in terms of four-dimensional vectors. And so you've now seen a, a position for vector and a velocity for vector. OK, enough. Good. Let's move on to the next section, which is something different, the Doppler effect. So I'm sure you all know, you've all experienced, you're, st you're standing in a, in a street and a car drives past and it sta the sound of the car goes like that, OK? It's the Doppler effect. So the, the frequency... This is sound, OK, but the frequency has changed. It was higher frequency to begin with, and then lower frequency. That's it. The same happens with light. Um, the frequency, so there's a classical Doppler effect, OK? So if there's a light approaching, then it will have slightly higher frequency. It will be blue shifted as it's approaching, and then as it goes away, the frequency will go down and it'll be red shifted. You only ever see the actual frequency that in the rest frame of the light source at one moment when it's just passing you, okay? Before then it's blue and then after that it's red shifted. So that's, that's all classical um, and special relativity, you, you might be pleased to know, does not throw that away. <laughs> We have been throwing quite a lot away, but it does not. So it keeps the classical Doppler effect, but it adds a little correction term. So the formula, the detailed formula for the Doppler effect is, is slightly different. And um, this is important. It turns out we can observe this if we look cleverly. I'll show you how. <coughs> so let's work out what the correction is. So we've got a light source P, and it's moving through S, S is our frame of, our usual frame of reference, um, it has an instantaneous velocity. It might be accelerating, actually. So I'm just going to talk about its velocity at one moment, OK? <coughs> so it has an instantaneous velocity u. So it's not necessarily, I, I don't have to, um, in fact, I don't want to arrange things in such a way that the light source is moving along the x-axis, okay? I want it to be, so it's, it's like this. I, I, if this is S, here's the light source, and it, it's moving somehow with instantaneous velocity u. So it's not lined up in any special way, OK? Um, I, want it, I want to know what its radial component is, though. So I need to project that down. So the radial component, that component there, I'm going to call UR. So the radial component of the velocity we need to know. Everybody happy with that? It'll have, in general, you would probably write this, well, you could write it in terms of spherical polar coordinates, in, in, in which case this would be one of the coordinates, OK? Normally, you would probably write it in x, y, z, t coordinates, in which case you'd have to work out what this radial component was. OK, so instantaneous velocity u and radial speed 
you are. <coughs> uh, right, I'll move over here. Let me just clear a board. Um, so I'm going to be thinking of light as a wave phenomenon and I'm going to be talking about the frequency of the wave train um, in a minute. So you, you imagine that you've got this nice wave, okay, being emitted by P. P is, I don't know, some light or something, somebody's iPhone, <laughs> um, and it's emitting light. And I'm, I'm going to imagine that we, we record um, at S here, here, we're sitting here watching, watching the light, and we're recording with some instrument the successive wave crests. So a wave, what I mean by a wave crest is this. This is the wave crest, and this is the next one, and this is the next one. So it doesn't have to be the crest, it could be this. Any, anything that measures the frequency, actually, is what I need. But let's talk about wave crests, it's what everybody does in the physics books. <coughs> now, let's suppose that um, the proper time... Whoops. So the time that P measures between uh, successive wave crests is delta tor. <coughs> is that right? Yep. Uh, no, I'm going to use infinitesimals. Ah, sorry. Just noticed. I don't have to actually, but I do want to think about maybe the maybe the particle is accelerating. In fact, there's a good example when I will need it to be accelerating. So I'm going to take detour. <coughs> so that's the proper time. So in S. Uh, this is uh, gamma of u d tor by time dilation. Where u is the Euclidean length of this vector. Okay, so far so good. In fact, we're, we've just got one more step now. <coughs> uh, if you imagine that we, we consider two of these, this one and then this one. Um, so we, we receive this one at some time in our frame. And then P has got to emit this one. But by the time P emits the second pulse, the second wave crest, it will have moved further away. And so that second pulse has got further to travel. Okay? And, and in fact, it's the radial component that will tell you how much further away it is. That's why I need the radial component. Uh, <coughs> so the next pulse, the next I'll call it a pulse or a wave crest, it doesn't matter which. Um, so it's not only emitted later, but it has further to travel. Uh, so it's travelled, travelling further, it's, so it's, this is the time it's got. And it's, it's, it's moving at a speed u r, according to us, 
So the extra time that it takes is that. Uh, yeah, so I've... Just a minute. <coughs> has further to... Has to travel further, so arrives... after the extra time times the extra distance, right, divided by the extra distance. So, so the, um, this will be the extra uh, time that's added on because the um, source is, is moving away, right. <coughs> OK, uh, so in S, therefore, we've got two things happening. Uh, we've got these two delays. We've got the delay because the, there's time dilation. And we've got the delay because, the extra delay, because uh, the source has moved away. So the... Uh, we have this equation that dt is the sum of these two things. It's going to be um, gamma detour plus this thing, gamma detour u r over c. In other words, it's, uh, oh, in fact, I'll leave it like that for the minute. Right. Good, and now I need that board. <coughs> uh, I didn't explain that very well. Would, is that okay? Would anybody like me to say any of that again, maybe more clearly? <laughs> Actually, this, apart from that gamma factor, this, this part is the classical part. Okay. What's new here is time dilation. So in the classical calculation, you'd say after the first pulse, the source of light has moved away, so it's delayed because it's got further to go. We're doing more than that. We're saying, and there's a ti there's time dilation happening. Now we, we switch to think about, we want to talk about frequency because that's how we detect the, op the Doppler effect, okay, and the change of frequency. And so um, <coughs> detour, that's supposed to be a tor, and dt are inversely proportional to the frequencies and I'm going to call frequencies using the Greek letter nu, nu zero and nu respectively. Oops. So um, nu zero is the frequency, it's the proper frequency, it's the frequency that the light source thinks it's using, and nu is the frequency that we are observing. <coughs> so we have the, the ratio of these two is the same as the ratio of detour and dt, but the other way up. So uh, it's dt over detour, because that's the, it's that way around, OK? Um, <coughs> and if you look at dt over detour, you get gamma into 1 plus ur over c. Uh, and how do I write that? I write it like this, actually. <laughs> Or in other words, it's 1 plus u r over c over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. <coughs> and we've almost finished now. I, I want to say a little bit more, but we've done all the hard work. So let me pause and check that everybody's happy with what I've done. Yeah. 
OK. Now, I, in order to compare this with the classical formula for the Doppler effect, I'm just going to use um, uh, uh, the usual Taylor expansion on, the, on this part here. And what you get is that it, the first few terms are this. It's 1 plus u r over c plus 1 half of u squared over c squared plus higher terms in terms of order u cubed over c cubed. OK. So I'm just, I'm just writing the Taylor expansion for this, multiplying by that factor and looking at the first few terms. <coughs> OK, uh, now it turns out that the, these terms here, the first two, are exactly the formula for the classical Doppler shift. So the next term is the primary effect from special relativity. <coughs> um, So if, if this is, if u r is positive, then the, the source is moving away from, from us and there's already a redshift. And the special relativity term says the redshift is bigger, OK? If u r is negative, which it can be because the, part, the source might be moving towards us, not necessarily directly towards us, but with a negative u r, then there's a blue shift, and the special relativity correction says, but it's not quite as blue as the classical formula. OK. Now, what's um, important, of course, is that I if, if the light source were moving transversely, right, as that was what it was doing, then u r is zero, and if it was moving in a circle, then u r would continue to be zero, right? And classically, there's no Doppler shift in that case, but there is in special relativity, and it's purely the time dilation Doppler shift. Okay, so that's rather nice actually. So even in in the case of purely circular motion, where there's no change in distance, the the fact that the light source's clock is going slowly, affects the frequency. Uh, in that case, so in the case, so if u r equals zero, um, there is still a shift. OK. Now, the other, the other special case, the other sort of extreme case, is where the, the motion of the light source is purely radial. So that's another possibility, right? Maybe the light source was moving completely away from the origin of S. That's, that's a possibility. Then, in that case now, um, UR is equal to U. And we've got a very nice uh, closed form for that. So, and then this thing simplifies, as you can easily check. So if u r equals u, then the Doppler shift is this. It's nu naught over nu equals uh, square root of c plus u over c minus u. <coughs> So that's quite a nice formula, just for purely radial motion. Um, and I mentioned that there was a, a nice experimental um, measurement which has confirmed this, this formula here, the 
the general formula. <coughs> and it was done by, let me write them down, Pound and Rebka in, um, what, when was this done? 1960. Uh, so what they observed was, so if you have, um, if you've got a, a radioactive substance in a crystal lattice, I don't know what particular substance they were looking at, but you, 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 ma you choose some, a material which is emitting gamma rays. Um, it's a radioactive material. It's emitting gamma rays, which, which are light rays. Okay. Um, and it's, it's held in a, a crystal structure. And if the, if the crystal is hot, then the, the atoms in the crystal structure are going to be vibrating. They're storing the thermal energy by vibration. Okay. And the vibrations are all in random directions. So there's a sort of average velocity that, that all the vibrations have, and it will depend on the temperature, but the directions are all random. And now if you look at this formula, you can see that because the directions are all random, these, some of these URs are going to be positive and some of them are going to be negative. And on average, this term cancels out. But this term does not, you see. So you can detect a sort of Doppler shift in that radioactive crystal structure. And they did. They detected this term. What happens is that the spectral lines um, w would be, let me just think. Yeah, so um, th the fact that these are all random here um, makes the spectral lines that you're observing broader. It makes them fuzzy, right? But this term makes the spectral, that fuzzy spectral line, it makes it shift because of the Doppler effect, because of the relativistic Doppler effect. So that's quite a nice, it was a clever idea that they had that they would be able to observe this term in that way. <coughs>